Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Good afternoon, 4040 listeners. Welcome back to another episode of the 4040 podcast. And, I have to say, the final one of the season. Crazy, isn't it? For any of you active listeners out there, you may have noticed that there has been a considerable gap between the last two episodes of the podcast. The reason for this was that I have been waiting on releasing a certain episode and I've been waiting for confirmation by this this other person so that I could release it before Steve's episode and I I haven't heard anything since then. So I think that it would be a good idea to to get this episode out. If I do happen to get confirmation from this other person, then I may possibly add it post season. Exciting. (laughs) So, alas, we've had a lot of episodes going through the works, and, you know, we've been up and running for about a year or so. So happy that the the way that the podcast is going, and today I've got something very, 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 very special for you to round up the season. We're going to be talking about Neurotribes by Steve Silberman. We're going to be looking a little bit into the history of autism and also what may be in store for the future of autistic people. <clears throat> Steve was once a writer for Wired and he's done numerous articles on Asperger's and autism, most notably so, the Geek Syndrome. Neurotribes is perhaps one of the most standout books that I've ever read. I guess with our modern times, we, we very much focus on the present, focus on what's happening around us, focusing on action now, but rarely do we have time to reflect on the past. And for me, Neurotribes has, has been something really special for me because I didn't really have a good framework for how autism was in the past and the sorts of figures that really made quite a big impact on society. Steve's work on Neurotribes has been highlighted in many, many UK and US newspapers and media sites, including The Guardian, Forbes, The New York Times, all of those really high-profile media organisations. Although not autistic himself, he has poured his heart and soul into the creation of Neurotribes, and yeah, I'm utterly dumbfounded that he's decided to come onto the podcast. Anyway, how are you doing today, Steve? Great. Uh, I'm very, very glad to be here with you. Thank you so much. It's actually a beautiful day in San Francisco, which is nice. Where are you geographically? I'm in the UK. So the weather at the moment, it's it's very temperamental. It's very up and down. Sunny, then it's rainy, then it's cloudy. (laughs) Makes it very difficult to organize those outside social events. Oh, yes, exactly. Yep, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, we, you know, I, I can't wait to get back to the UK. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love it there. I have many friends there. I have even have many autistic friends there by now. And, uh, I, there are various groups that I've met with there. I went to a great, um, autistic run autism conference. Mm. It was run by a group called autistic UK, uh, in Manchester a couple of years ago. And it was Probably the best autism conference I ever went to. You know what? One of my friends, Vicky, is an autism advocate. And she always raves about these conferences in Manchester. Yeah. And I, I should really go to one, considering how close yeah. it is to where I live. And yeah. the fact that I do actually know quite a few people in Manchester. Yeah, if I ever get invited back, we should have tea or yes. go to a pub or something. That would be really if cool. If one can do that. <laughs> 
Maybe yeah. outside in the yes. drizzly UK yes. rain. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, there's been a few updates since we last spoke. And I think what one thing that you mentioned to me during our pre chat was that someone that you knew sort of developed this book called A Cure for Darkness, mm -hmm. which I believe was kind of going into the history of mental health. And I was really excited to read it, but I usually listen to a lot of my books. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, I just find it really difficult reading books. I like to do other things while I'm, while I'm listening to a book. I find it quite difficult to, to sit down and flick the pages and, and get into a rhythm. And so I looked up to see if the book was anywhere else. And it's on Audible now. Oh, good. So good. I was very happy about that. I'm definitely going to be reading that at some point. Yeah, that's Alex Riley's book. And uh, it focuses specifically on the history of depression mm -hmm. and its treatment. And um, Alex came to San Francisco several years ago uh, after my book Neurotribes came out and mm. said that he had really enjoyed Neurotribes and that he was thinking about writing a book about depression, which Alex personally struggles with kind of based on the model of neurotribes. And I must yeah. say, um, I thought it was a great idea, but also an incredibly ambitious project. <laughs> and here was this completely charming, energetic, you know, but depressed, you know, young man uh, telling me that he wanted to do this. And I thought, wow, good luck. <laughs> you know? wow. And then, yeah. and then I got the manuscript like three years later and it was just so good. And um, I've done a, uh, I did an online event with Alex at uh, my local bookstore called The Booksmith. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a really, really, it's a very good book. And I have a member of my family who struggles with depression. And I was able to give her Alex's book. And I think it really helped her contextualize her own experience. Um, so yeah, it's a, I definitely recommend that book, A Cure for Darkness by Alex Riley. I am... Definitely looking forward to getting my ears into that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another thing that I noticed whilst looking through a little bit of the news, you have been shortlisted for a prize. The, I believe, the, the Samuel Johnson Prize. Yeah, I was not just shortlisted. I actually won the prize. Brilliant. Um, I'm so and, glad. And it was the, <laughs> yeah, it was the very first science book in history uh, to win the Samuel Johnson Prize, which is now called the Bailey Gifford Prize. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was a complete surprise to me, I must say. I went there, I went to England uh, for the ceremony, and I assumed I would lose. And I took, uh, I specifically chose my date, who is a wonderful woman, because she's snarky. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> if I lose... You know, she'll have the, the most biting you know, <laughs> comments to, to console me with. And instead I won. And it, and it shocked both of us, wow. really. And um, there's an ironic footnote to that event, which is that uh, I, I won the prize just before the Brexit vote. Then the Brexit vote <laughs> happened, and we all know what happened there. And because of the Brexit vote, my prize was worth a lot less money by the time I got oh. back to the States, um, oh, <laughs> the exchange the currency. rate. Yeah, exactly. The exchange rate. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. The pound has absolutely yeah. plummeted in comparison to the dollar. It is not, not doing not well. Not good. So, so <laughs> yes. I mean, and I also thought, I mean, we're getting away from, you know, the subject of autism or my book yeah. or whatever, but. I also, it was also sad for me because I thought, oh my God, the Brits are making the same mm. mistake that people did here with Trump, you know, and just believing this nonsense. <sighs> so the world has been going through a lot, the hardest years <laughs> of my life. Yeah. Like, I mean, I can't even, you know, my husband and I were talking the other day. My husband is Ward Q Normal on Twitter. My husband and I were talking the other day that it was like, Things have gotten so much worse in the world uh, in the last few yeah. years that it's even hard to 
describe the difference to younger people who weren't there. Yeah. Like life has become much more tense and anxiety producing and depressing and uncomfortable and scary and dangerous. And, um, you know, it's, it's daunting, you know, it's just been, it's been an absolute nightmare, a, you know, bad acid trip on mass, <laughs> you know, for, for years. It's definitely been a tumultuous, a t- tumultuous time. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's, it's just little things that, that I hear from people in different workplaces, in education, within psychiatric groups and such. There seems to be an overarching low mood and anxiety among any any yeah. place that I look at, even with friends, family. I think all of this has affected us more than we think, and we can see it. Definitely. But I think it's also for people who feel like they like they've conceptualized it they know what's happening it still does affect you a little bit oh, kind of yeah. subconsciously i would say yes um i'm i'm curious i mean i know that anxiety is a huge problem for people on the spectrum in general even without you know global fascism mm. um yeah. do you feel like the autistic people that you know have been particularly affected by this historical period? I'd say that outwardly, probably not, but I have definitely mm-hmm. noticed a trend. Mm-hmm. It seems to be that the creators and influencers in the autistic community, are st- they're, kind of, they're still putting things out, but there doesn't seem to be as much active discussion between people. Mm. You know, people, they have very low contact you know, when mm-hmm. compared to pre-COVID. And I'm so... Uh, I feel like everyone's burying their head in the sand and... Yeah. I've always been really into my gym or, or fitness or sports. It really helps me with my anxiety. So I'm just kind of taking pleasure in it for as long as possible. Just yeah, in case great. they close again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you vaccinated? I'm not... Not at the yeah. moment now. I was thinking of trying to get myself vaccinated because I know that autistic people are sort of higher mm-hmm. in, in priority than other people in the UK, but mm-hmm. I, di- I didn't really feel it was necessary. So I've, you know, I, I, although on paper I am a priority group, I don't know. I just, I just feel like, you know, it will come to me if, if, if and when I need it. Um, I want to make sure that other people who really need it uh, before me get to have it. Do you have an official diagnosis? Yes. What do you think about um, the issue about uh, self-diagnosis? Like I, I, you know, having written a history of autism, I understand the barriers to diagnosis, particularly for women, particularly for people of color. Even if you're a white cis male, uh, it can be really expensive and elaborate. So I understand the the uh, need to respect self-diagnoses. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that subject? I think there's a bit of, you know, because we live in a very socially progressive time and there's lots of backlash and lots of drama online about categorization and such. And I think people lump autism into that. Mm-hmm. Um you know, autistic people self-diagnosing into that too much. I think we have a long way to go in terms of diagnostic procedures and understanding more about the more about autism. And we don't really have a specialized diagnostic criteria for women, for example, as you said, which is something mm-hmm. that actually my, my friend Vicky from Actually Aspling, she's a psychologist and mm-hmm. she's been Mm-hmm. researching into this area yeah. and working on a more specialized diagnostic pathway for women which is really great of course but it's very different in the UK of course in terms of finances so i can empathize mm-hmm. more with self-diagnosed people in in america and mm-hmm. the us same thing <laughs> yeah we don't have an nhs just cuz it's not so widely yeah. and easily available as in the UK. 
But do you mind if we move on to the first yeah. question? Would that be all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am very much enjoying our little chat. But I also know that you're a very busy man and sure. time is precious. Sure. Could you tell us a little bit about the journey that you went on sure. yeah. writing Neurotribes? When did you start? What sort of notable experiences did you have? Why? <laughs> Why did you do it? Why did you decide to write a book about autism? Tell me. <laughs> well, I was a science writer for Wired magazine uh, for 15 years. And in the course of that, in back in, um, I think it was 1999, I went on a cruise ship that was had been chartered by a tech entrepreneur who wanted to have tech conferences on cruise ships rather than like the Holiday Inn in Pittsburgh. Right? Yeah. So he he got a cruise ship to sail up the Alaskan panhandle, mm -hmm. and there were more than 100 computer programmers on the boat, mm. including a guy named Larry Wall, who uh, invented a programming language called Perl, which was an open source language and um, became very important, particularly once the web launched, yeah, uh, because it was the underlying uh, programming in many, many things like Amazon and Craigslist and the Internet Movie Database. And it even got incorporated into Microsoft software. <laughs> so um, he, I noticed when I talked to him at dinner every night that he was brilliant and hilarious and wonderful and also quite eccentric. <laughs> and um, I noticed that actually quite a few of the computer programmers on the ship you know, were either, you know, socially awkward yeah. or, yeah. you know, eccentric in some way. And it certainly had very passionate interests. Mm -hmm. They, I wouldn't say that they were narrow interests, which is the traditional autism stereotype, uh, which is false in my view. But um, they were very intense and very passionate. <laughs> and it was as if they had been, you know, kind of teenage fanboys of various things but then had figured out how to turn them into valuable careers. Um, yeah, yeah. So as I was uh, coming back into port on the boat, I asked Larry if I could interview him at home in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. And he said, yeah, sure, but I should tell you, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. And what everyone forgets, because it was so recent, but the world has changed so much, is that back in 1999, autism was considered very, very rare. Uh, estimates of its prevalence were something like one in 10,000. That's crazy. Know? So even clinicians who'd worked with uh, autism for decades thought that autism was rare. Uh, so when he told me that he had an autistic daughter, it didn't really register. And then when I interviewed him, his daughter was not there, but I noticed some sensory modifications in his house, like. He had swapped the buzzer on his clothes dryer out for a little light bulb yeah. that would light up silently yeah. uh, if uh, the cycle finished. So um, I didn't know enough about autism to relate those sensory accommodations to his daughter's autism yet. But then about six months later, I was writing another article for Wired about uh, a woman in a family whose father had built the first computer in the Middle East back in the 1940s. So another technologically very adept family. Wow. And I said, uh, I asked her if I could interview her sister. And her sister said, yeah, um, we should tell you, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. <laughs> and I thought, God, that's funny. You know? It's Groundhog Day. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I was sitting in a cafe in San Francisco, <laughs> and I told that exact story to a friend of mine. And a woman at the next table said, Oh my God, do you realize what's going on? And I said, what's going on? And she said, there's an epidemic of autism in Silicon oh, no. Valley. Something <laughs> terrible is happening to our children. So I like, you know, I like heard like the chords of doom on the soundtrack, yeah. you know? Yeah. And because I was a science writer, I thought, well, I, you know, that sounds scary, but I wonder if it's actually really true, you know? So I went on to, to do an investigative piece mm -hmm. called The Geek Syndrome, which got published and wired in uh, 2001. 
Uh, right after I turned it in, 9-11 happened. So I figured no one would ever read it, really. No one would care. Of course. You know? Yeah. And um, yeah. what I focused on was not what everyone in Silicon Valley was telling me about vaccines or Wi-Fi or silicon from the computer chips getting into the water <laughs> supply you know everybody I'd had say. these bs theories you know really um and they've yeah. been you know yeah. consulting dr google or whatever and or dr alta vista maybe at the time but anyway um so i focused on genetics and uh i noticed as many people have noticed um uh, most notably simon baron cohen that um mm. Autism seemed to come along not only with a bunch of challenges, but uh, in some cases, a bunch of gifts or aptitudes or um, enhancements or strengths. And they were almost never discussed. The, the aptitudes and strengths of autistic people were almost never discussed, except as a sort of curiosity about, yeah. you know, a particularly yeah. small group of autistic people who were called savants. And they would, you know, be praised for truly amazing feats, I must say, like remembering yeah. what the weather was, you know, on a net particular afternoon 30 years ago. So like, like Rain Man would be the typical savant in, right, exactly. in most people's minds. Right. And uh, although what people, as I, as I examine in my book, what people forget about Rain Man, I mean, it's like everybody now is like, oh, Rain Man, oh my God. That was a horrible, you know, <laughs> movie that launched this autistic stereotype. Yes, it did, but it was also the very first time that mm. an autistic adult was depicted yeah, on screen. I, I completely agree with you. Most people, even in the field of autism, didn't know that autistic adults existed, really. So in that sense, it was a very groundbreaking film. And yeah. Dustin Hoffman's performance was based on... Uh, the lives and behavior of really, you know, real life autistic people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one of whom I met, Mark Rimland. But in any case, so my article came out and it was not ignored, actually. Uh, and the amazing thing about it was that for 10 years, almost every week, I got email from people who'd read it saying, yeah. um, oh, I really recognize my own grandfather who used to talk about World War II all the time or... I really recognize my brother, or I really recognize <laughs> myself. genetics. But also, they were talking about problems in accessing basic services, like health care, uh, you know, before Obamacare, or the American, uh, uh, whatever it's called, the Amer <laughs> ACA. Before Obamacare, you know, it was very difficult to get health care in America. So um, yeah. I realized that, while the world was talking about, oh my God, there's an autism epidemic, which by the way, there wasn't, and there never was. And oh my God, it's vaccines. Oh my God, it's Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's, that was all bollocks. And what I figured out was that the reason why people thought there was an autism epidemic was because of a chain of events in autism history yeah. that is the plot of neurotribes, basically. Yeah. So um, the more that time went on, I kept seeing articles, like even in kind of major newspapers like the New York Times, what, you know, the increase in estimates of autism prevalence are a puzzle, a baffling enigma. We do not know why. And I, you know, after a while, I was like, why don't we know why? We have scientists. <laughs> why can't we do studies on this? You know? Yeah. And then if you, you know, some people did the studies, you know? And it was like, well, no, actually, vaccines don't cause autism. And yeah. well, no, actually, there isn't an autism mm -hmm. epidemic. There's what I like to call an epidemic of recognition, like undiagnosed exactly. autistic people yes. are being seen yes. for the first time. And so I thought, well, um, somebody has to try to fix this because it's causing not just a tremendous amount of misconceptions and, you know, great unhappiness and shame. You know, I read anti-vaccine parents posting about how the day they ruined their child's oh, lives God. was the day they brought them for a measles vaccine, you know? And, and, uh, uh, and now, yeah, just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and now, by the way, it's okay. You know, with, with COVID, we can have 
The level up autism. Right. <laughs> Power up. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, right, I was just going to say, I mean, now with COVID, we see really the the hellscape that the anti-vaccine people are, are I mean, they're literally murdering yeah. people by, by uh, trashing vaccines. So in it's any case, um, so I wrote the book. It took much longer than I thought it would. Um, it was difficult financially. Uh, you know, I was no longer writing for mm-hmm. Wired. My husband supported me in San Francisco on a teacher's salary, which is not easy. You know, I sold a bunch of Grateful Dead CDs, you know, to buy cat food. That literally happened. Um, so you poured your entire being I did. into and, this project. This yep. new and I did become obsessed, like they say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then it came out and I... The whole time I was writing it, I thought everyone would hate it. Uh, I thought the anti-vaccine people would hate it because I was not just saying that they were wrong. I was showing why they were Mm. wrong. I feared that autistic people would hate it because I'm not autistic. And so it was like, you know, history of feminism written by a man, you know, or something. Um, I do understand. Yep. I think it's a, an issue, I guess, with anything that is sort of, based on group dynamics and about certain groups or categories of people. Yeah. Especially in these times, we tend to be very cagey about letting people in and letting others' voices be heard. Right. And I understand that completely. Mm. I'm gay. If someone had written a homosexual, you know, a history of homosexuality or something and had been straight, I would have been like, really? Okay. You know, I mean, I, I one, you know, I would have read it before trashing it. I, you know, which yeah. I didn't always get the courtesy of, yeah. but um, I completely yeah. understand. And if anything, my book is testimony to why autistic people are skeptical yeah. Yeah. of neurotypical views. It goes into great mm-hmm. depth about that actually. And um, neurotypical people have done, you know, har- I mean, my book is practically, the history of mistreatment of autistic people, really. Mm -hmm. And so one change that happened inside me while writing Neurotribes was that when I set out to write it, I was kind of thought I was writing a science book. (laughs) And by the end of it, I felt like I had written a journey towards liberation of a group of people, of a minority of people who were finally able to see one another and talk to one another and organize. Yeah. So I went through that change too. And um, I was very, very happy when I showed the completed manuscript to some of my autistic friends, like Ari Neumann of the Autism Self-Advocacy Network here in the United States, yeah, and got the thumbs up. Uh, and eventually, um, ASAN, Ari's organization, gave me Ally of the Year Award, which was uh, Hooray! A big relief. Yay! So You're that in was the club. Good. You're in the group. <laughs> yeah, sort of. I mean, I, I you've got a honorary <laughs> right. autism diagnosis. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it's funny. You know, something that I mention sometimes is that when I tell people that I've written a history of autism, the first qu- question that I usually get is, "Oh, do you have an autistic child?" <laughs> and I, I, I think that's a funny <laughs> comment because. <laughs> It's as if no one would ever write, you know, I'm a science writer, you know, it's like, yeah. I don't need to have an autistic child to be interested in autism, you know? People get obsessed with yeah. it. It's on the surface level, it, it appears very simple and plain and, you know, it's a disorder. Right. But as soon as you get a little bit below the surface, a little bit behind yeah. it, I've seen it particularly with a man called John Offord, who's started off his his own podcast and i think you've actually been on that that in the past and he initially was going to do his podcasts around sort of mental health and mental disorders but after interviewing me he started to invite other autistic people on and people who are sort of big names and researchers in in the world of autism so i think after a while the the shine of it really does come come through as soon as they take that that leap into understanding and and getting interested in that topic of autism right (laughs) and one thing that i've tried to do 
very, very deliberately is to yeah. foreground autistic voices in the social conversation about autism. Brilliant. Um, and I've done that by like, okay, so a few years ago I got a, or a couple of years ago even really, I got a manuscript in the mail from uh, the mother of a 15-year-old in Wales who told me that her son mm -hmm. had written a book. And I thought, oh, how her autistic son, you know. <laughs> so I thought, oh, how, how sweet. You know, I'll, I'll read this book. And I started reading the book. And after about halfway down the first page, I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, this kid is like the, the – it's like the best literary debut I've read in years. This kid is like a young Oliver Sacks, and it's Dara McAnulty, and the book was Diary of a Young Naturalist. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've um, that, I when I read it, yeah, yeah, and when I read it, you know, it was like getting a, you know, it was like getting, it was like hearing the Beatles, you know, <laughs> in in a club in Hamburg, Germany, or something, and saying like, these guys are going to change the world, you know. And so I, I literally like wrote back like. Your son is <laughs> a genius. Um, it's what we like and to hear. Now, kind of like the whole world knows that Tara McNulty yeah. is a genius. Yeah. And he basically swept the British Book Awards. Mm -hmm. um, he got many, I think he got more awards than I did, really. And he deserves it. And uh, he is just an awesome young man. And I hope to interview him actually mm -hmm. uh, again about his book because it's coming out in the States. But if you have not read, Dara McAnulty's Diary of a Young Naturalist. Yeah. List of you should. audiobooks. It's, it's awesome. And and also, you know, I make an effort to I mean, it's not like I'm, you know, a big effort. It's I mean, I'm I just do it a lot. Is uh retweeting autistic mm. perspectives on current events, like yeah. when uh the lawyer of the um <laughs> well, a guy I don't like who's in QAnon, who dresses up in shaman costumes when he's breaking into the u.s capitol to overturn a national election you know yesterday you know his lawyer said oh he's autistic these people yeah. are all short bus people the lawyer said and i won't even he used the r word too and so you know i had things to say about that but i also definitely tweeted autistic mm. statements on on that so we yeah. could get of course. You know, own voices, as they say, into the media mix. That is yeah. incredibly yeah. important. It's very invaluable to include. It's almost like a sort of media type co production. Yeah. You're involving people in the social yeah. narrative of things, which is, yeah. I think, se severely lacking yeah. in, in mainstream. And I've media. tried to do, sorry, you know, I mean, Neurotribes uh, did pretty well, and, and it, uh, you know, so I got a lot of like media requests in the year after it was published, but I've definitely tried to make myself available to uh, you know, autistic people with podcasts, <laughs> which is what I'm doing now, you know? And so um, I think it's really important to mainstream the idea. And because I'm in the journalism mainstream, sort of, I mean, I'm considered a weirdo <laughs> with bizarre interests, but who, you know... That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it's very important to spread the notion that the most trustworthy source often for autistic experience is autistic people. So it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors, Timo. If you love visual support in your scheduling, Timo is for you. The app was designed for people with ADHD and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work. Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Anyway, let's get back into the show. So, Neurotribes explores the importance of autistic figures in history and the way that autistic communities have grown in the near yeah. present. And, of course, the possibilities for the future place for autistic people. Yeah. I guess the issues that I've personally researched 
and focused around is the scientific literature, the here and now, the present, the the issues in education and social care. Mm -hmm. One thing that really struck me about Neurotribes is that it gave me a really great understanding of the history around it. And that really helps mm -hmm. me frame autism, you know, have a good rounding frame for autism around the ages, especially with Hans Asperger. Mm -hmm. I think in the present day, we've made substantial steps towards a more integrated world for autistic people in science and, you know, in media, mm -hmm. public understanding, <laughs> although not quite there. So I guess I hope that our conversation today can integrate the past of autism into the present and suggest things that could lie in the future. So, so starting at the beginning, mm -hmm. in Neurotribes, you look at how the history of autism came to be, the history of how autism mm -hmm. came to be. Mm -hmm. So could you take us through the, the key players in forming that first conceptual sure. idea of what autism uh, is. Well, Grunia Sukareva was a, um, a Russian uh, psychiatrist, I believe. She might have been a psychologist. But she wrote the, the most in-depth first description of people with what would later be called Asperger syndrome. We use a hard G in America on, in Asperger's <laughs> name. And, and it was a, a fascinating paper. And the sort of the wit and playful spirit and uh, the challenges and the character, the autistic yeah. character of the kids that she was writing about were very memorable. But there was a problem. She identified the kids she was writing about as having schizotypal behavior, so mm. somehow related to schizophrenia. Yeah. And so that, that paper sort of ended up getting forgotten, really. I wrote about it at some length in Neurotribes, but the world had really not talked much about her uh, before that. So then kind of the next time that autism was glimpsed, you could say, in uh, the published literature, was writing from Hans Asperger's clinic at the University of Vienna in the 1930s. And there, Hans Asperger and... I want to crucially mention his two colleagues, Annie Weiss and George Frankel, who were Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, started to look at autistic people in a much more holistic way. And the clinic was, up to a point, a very humane place. Yeah. Uh, there was, they would do, you know, play, they would write plays, they would walk in the garden, mm -hmm. they had art on the walls. It was designed not to be some kind of brutal institution, but to be a place where people could learn to mm -hmm. be comfortable with themselves and could get the kinds of support they needed. The and Heil one of the things, ped pedagogic. Sorry, I can never say that so, right. Right, uh, right, right, <laughs> uh, right. How high pedagogic, I think, or I might be wrong, but uh, <laughs> in any case, in any case, and you know, one of the things that they talked about was that. Autistic, you know, quote unquote, special interests that would later become very stigmatized. Asperger knew that if a child had, a, say, a passionate interest in geometry, that if that was supported and encouraged rather than being discouraged as obsessive or something, mm. that they could then go on to even possibly a future career, that it would mm, become a yeah. stepping stone yeah. to a, an adult identity that could. Mm -hmm become a member of society. And so yeah. that was all good. But then uh, 1938, the Germans marched over the mountains from Austria or into Austria from uh, Berlin and took over the country. And Austria became a Nazi country. And there were already a bunch of Nazi sympathizers at Asperger's uh, hospital. His boss was a, was a very fervent Nazi, as I talk about in Neurotribes. Mm. And the, his German, Asperger's Jewish assistants, who had very much helped him conceptualize what we now call the spectrum model of autism, were forced to leave the country. Uh, what no one knew until I wrote Neurotribes was that they came to America and started working with a guy named Leo Connor, 
It looks like Canner, but it's pronounced Connor. And um, he was uh, working at Johns Hopkins uh, in, in America. And in fact, when Leo Connor saw his first autistic patient, he did not know what to make of him. So he sent him to George Frankel for an examination. And George Frankel immediately recognized him as autistic. So it was considered, it was mistakenly considered for decades, a mere mm-hmm. coincidence or some kind of synchronicity that Connor and Asperger both wrote descriptions of autism in the early 1940s. It was not a coincidence or accident or synchronicity at all. Yeah. Uh, Connor was working with two of Asperger's closest colleagues <laughs> who had been working with autistic people for years Sneaky. at every point on the spectrum. So, but, but there was a problem there too, which is that Leo Connor decided eventually, being a very ambitious man, mm-hmm. that if he said that autism was genetic, that there would be no role for child psychiatrists. And Leo Connor was one of the first child psychiatrists in America. So he then, even though in his very first paper on autism, he says, you know, it's probably genetic. He then took a different approach in later papers and started blaming parents for being what he called emotional refrigerators. Refrigerator mothers. Yes, exactly. Right. And not not knowing, you know, how to show love or affection for their kids. And that theory, particularly when popularized by a best-selling fraud named uh, Bruno Bettelheim in a best-selling fraudulent book called The Empty Fortress. Uh, Bruno Bettelheim popularized the notion of refrigerator mothers, which added to the shame and secrecy around having an Mm. autistic child. So Connor's shift from genetics to psychology was disastrous for autistic people. Also, because Connor was trying to propose a new diagnosis, autism, a new diagnostic entity, he was careful to try to define it very narrowly. And he ended up defining it way too narrowly. He ended up claiming that autism was um, particularly endemic to wealthy, upper middle class white families. Well, what was particularly endemic to you know, wealthy middle class white families was having access to Leo Connor's <laughs> diagnosis. You know, people of All color, the money. No, people of color, no. Even though I discovered most of the patients at Johns Hopkins were people of color, Leo Connor was not seeing them. They didn't have access to him. So for decades, autism was misconceived as a primarily white diagnosis. Mm-hmm. I spoke to a a psychiatrist who started doing autism diagnoses in the 1940s, so shortly after Leo Connor uh, wrote his mm-hmm. paper, and she told me that up through the 1990s, by the time she gave a child a diagnosis, most of the families had been through 10 therapists before they got to Whoa. her. So how many families do you think could afford to doctor shop their way through 10 therapists, you know, that <laughs> Not was many, right. And so <laughs> is it all. any surprise that when Lorna wing in the, uh, uh, in Lorna. the late 1970s and 1980s started asking, well, how many of these cases of Connor autism, because Connor's definition was so close to, um, you know, sort of the standard yeah. that people even called it Connor autism or classical autism, it's called sometimes. You know, Lorna started saying, like, well, how many of these people are there? Because she was asked by someone who was an official who was with the NHS to try to estimate the number of autistic uh, kids in Camberwell, a suburb of London. Mm -hmm. And so she started looking for autistic kids, and what she found was, well, yeah, there are not that many cases of Connor autism. And in fact, her daughter had Connor autism, so she had reason to believe in the diagnosis. But she started seeing all these people who had what she described to me as bits and pieces of Connor syndrome. And these were the people who we would now recognize as people like you, people who are on the spectrum, 
Aspies. But don't have classical. Con- yes. Right. <laughs> Maybe not Aspies anymore. Yeah, not Aspies Autistic anymore. Autistic people. Right. Autis. Autistic people. She, start- <laughs> she saw the spectrum. Yeah. And what's interesting is that Asperger had definitely seen this. As- Asperger and his Jewish colleagues had definitely seen the spectrum too. And in fact, in internal communications between themselves, they called it the continuum. So the continuum or spectrum was something that was known about autism as early as the 1930s, but that information got lost. Why? Because no one wanted to read articles in German journals right after World War II. And Leo Connor was Jewish, and um, he especially, you know, like there are people who say, well, maybe Connor didn't read. Yeah, German was his native language, by the way, or one of his native languages. So, yes, he was definitely reading the, that particular journal, mm. but he did not mention Asperger until very late in his career. And I suspect it's because he suspected that Asperger had Nazi ties. That's, that's crazy. It's a really cool connection. Yes. It makes a lot of yes, sense. Yes, it makes me. a lot of sense. Did you figure out that yourself? Like, did for your research and such? Yes, I figured all that out myself. Wow. And um, wow. something I want to point out is that uh, it's become, you know, quite popular to reject, you know, the label of Asperger's or to reject mm-hmm. Asperger as yeah. a Nazi collaborator. Uh, I'm not even going to address that directly, although there are things that are not widely known by the world that someday will be known. Mm-hmm. But here's one thing that is absolutely inarguable. Asperger's Jewish colleagues were not Nazis. And needless to say, they were forced to leave the country because of the Nazis. And they were key in developing Asperger's concept of the spectrum. Or you could really say the concept of the spectrum was developed by not just Asperger, but also George Frankel, Annie Weiss, and other people. And um, there was a memoir written by a a boy named Hansi Buston, who was a Jewish boy who was hidden in the apartment of Joseph Feldner, another of Asperger's closest colleagues, through the war. Mm. So you can imagine the danger that Joseph Feldner was putting himself in by having that boy hidden in Mm -hmm. his apartment. And not just hidden, they would occasionally go to the opera, in fact, And after the war, Hansi Bustin wrote a memoir in which he described the anti-Nazi resistance within Asperger's clinic, which obviously included Joseph Feldner. That has all been washed away. You know, uh, I understand, you know, very much because I mapped out the horrible uh, action T4 that the Nazis committed against disabled children as a practice run for the Holocaust against the Jews. So I'm not, you know, dismissing that at all. It's horrible. It's one of the great crimes Mm. of world history against humanity. But if we're throwing away the insights of Asperger's Jewish colleagues to get rid of Asperger, I think that's premature. Um, Certainly, if we're throwing away the concept of the spectrum as somehow a Nazi idea, I think that's terrible. And, uh, you know, you know I, I, one I of the books that you. is... Con- I really do. If, that, if that's the history behind it, then... Yeah. You know, I encourage anybody who's listening, you know, this is one of the reasons why I wanted, wanted you to come on the podcast and talk to me, because... Thank you. I see a lot of, a lot of posts and a lot of, of people writing to me saying, you know, what, why do you have... Why are you so yeah. attached to to your YouTube name, Asperger's Growth? Um, but you know, it was very enlighten, enlightening for me to read about the the real history behind Asperger and his colleagues, and and how they really formulated sure. the autism diagnosis. So let's jump to the last question, and as mm-hmm. I know, you're a very busy man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I don't want to keep you too long. So we're currently in an era of social progression, putting more and more emphasis on diversity and inclusion each and every day. What do you believe lies in the future of autistic people and neurodiversity? 
Do you think there's many challenges that we need to yes, overcome? Yes, there are many challenges. Uh, and, you know, one example of things that are... Okay, I have a basically optimistic view. Good. At the same time, I very much recognize that I don't think that the time that we're living through is an undeniable story of progress yeah. because there are also terrible things happening. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, for instance, the treatment mm -hmm. of uh, not just autistic, but other disabled people in the COVID-19 pandemic, like, you know, who's going to get the vaccines? Who gets the care? Who gets the do not resuscitate orders, oh, you know, when the person God. becomes sick, you know? I must say, you know, oh, it's awful. I, you know, having just written a book about eugenics, you know, five <laughs> years ago, in part, I must say, it was quite shocking to me how quickly even sort of, you know, reasonable, you know, moderate people immediately yeah. embraced eugenics. You know, it's yeah. like, well, we have to save the healthy people, you know, these people have uh, pre-existing pre conditions. It They're is not really dying. Depressing. You know, it's very demoralizing. Right. So so that's terrible. But what's good? What's good is that companies are really starting to uh, understand that they need to make accommodations uh, and create support systems for people on the spectrum, not to be nice, not for charity, but so that their businesses will do better and make more money. And, you know, so their stock prices will go up. Because people who are neurodivergent have valuable <laughs> insights and see problems from angles exactly. that nobody else can see. And so if you have neurodivergent people on your team, it will be a more effective team. And this is not just some liberal fantasy. This has like been shown over and over again. And so, I, you know, and these are very concrete things that can be done and that are not, you know, will not. Uh, require changing the entire world to make them happen. <laughs> I was recently asked to give a lecture to a company about what kinds of accommodations would make it easier for uh, autistic people to feel comfortable in employment there. Yeah. And so I asked a bunch of autistic people for their suggestions. And they're very, you know, they're kind of very basic common sense things. Let me, uh, I'll just read a couple. The standard interview process is basically a list of things that many autistic people find stressful mm -hmm. or struggle to do well. Yeah. Look the interviewer in the eye. Strong handshake. Sell yourself. <laughs> be a real team player. Rethink interview. Oh, well, those social you know, things. Rethink interview and onboarding processes to get beyond the notion that you hire people like us. Like that's what I hear all the time in Silicon. Well, we want to hire people like us. And, you know, they're usually like, you know, young white guys. You know what? I would love for the interview process to be to just write mm -hmm. a short essay on why yeah. you should hire me. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, that would be so much better. For me, I guess I've done a lot of work on social presentation and uh, communicating with the neurotypical people. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's not something that I struggle with personally. But I know that many, many autistic people do struggle Yes, in that environment. Even neurotypical people struggle. And even with that, there is actually a lady who, is, who I'm going to be talking to called Marcel Ciampi. Oh, I, I love her, actually. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've read her upcoming book. And, and yeah, learned, well. Yeah, she's awesome. She was talking about how, I, th I think it was Marcel. Yeah, yeah. Someone that I know of. Marcel, probably. <laughs> Someone that's an activist for autism. Yeah. An advocate. Well, they identified a specific problem with the way that, that people are in, in companies are integrating autistic people into the workplace. Some companies are doing a lot of work in diversity, getting autistic people into the workplace. Mm. But the problem is, is that they're not, training the managers they're not training yes. the team they're not making them aware and, and making them or helping them understand autism and so when they get into the team they, they have all these really really strong difficulties that quite often lead to a, a very low job satisfaction and 
and possibly exacerbating a lot of the the mental health issues. Yes. Oh, absolutely. There must be communication. And in fact, I was very um, encouraged when I talked to a company yesterday, a big financial company that um, is having me uh, give a talk to their employees uh, next week, actually. And they said, you know, one thing that we really want to stress is that it's not just about getting the people into the building, that once (laughs) they work here, that they have, you know, peer mentoring from other autistic people on the spectrum, including managers, and that there are open lines of communication for feedback. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll read two more because they're super (laughs) good. Suggestions for making workplaces neurodiversity friendly. So-called open plan offices are often overwhelming for folks with sensory sensitivities. Create private spaces within offices or expand options for working remotely, you know. And now because of COVID, we've all discovered, well, actually, you know, those office teamwork exercises are not so important, you know. I've already (laughs) indulged in this within my new job. (laughs) Right, right. And, you know, in a sense, I'm working remotely right now, you know. You are. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, w- one thing I like to say, it's like sometimes I hear people say that, oh, my God, there's so much change, you know, and, yeah. and um, how can we possibly think about this? It's, you know, it's just so hopeless. This is what I point to. I have a wedding ring on my finger. When I was in uh, high school... Homosexuality was considered a mental disorder. It was in the mm-hmm. di- it was in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. If I had been found kissing my boyfriend, not that anyone would kiss me, <laughs> you know, at the time <laughs> because I was living in homophobia. Don't be so but, hard on yourself. But uh, you know, if I had been caught kissing my boyfriend, I could have been thrown in a mental asylum and given yeah. a lobotomy or put in jail yeah. because homosexuality was also a crime. I am now very happily married to Ward Q. Normal on Twitter, who is a gorgeous, brilliant, loving, so wonderful, pleased. sweet man. And that happened in my you must lifetime. Be so happy. Oh, yeah. That happened in my lifetime. So, uh, social change is possible. You just have to keep working for it. I really admire the autistic struggle for autonomy and self determination, mm-hmm. and I try to support it as, a, as an ally in whatever ways I can. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. I'd like to end by firstly, well, thanking you for coming on. I know that I'm a very small and independent podcast. I've actually tried quite a few times to get in contact with big or or public figures in the world of Mm -hmm. autism. And I I really have received such a small amount of responses and a lot of those responses don't tend to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm so grateful that you've taken the time out of your day to talk to me and to t- talk to my audience and, and to, to share some of your, your experience and knowledge. Oh, thank you. I hope you, I, hope you gr- I hope you grow your audience and you seem like a delightful person and I hope to someday meet you. Would you like to give out any links to your work? Or your your social media website. Oh, sure. Just just look for the book Neurotribes: The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. You can find it at independent booksellers as well as you know Amazon and Waterstones or whatever. I don't really care where you buy it, although Amazon (laughs) is probably evil. Um, (laughs) But uh, you know, support your. I love local bookstores, so um, hopefully, I'll be speaking to Dara McAnulty, the autistic wonderful author from Wales uh, for my local bookstore soon. And uh, I really appreciate it, Thomas. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Take care, Steve. See you later. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. So that rounds up another episode of the 40 Oti podcast. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening. I know I say this every time, and it's a little bit of a podcaster, YouTube stereotype to thank you, but Honestly, I, I, I never expected this thing to take off as much as it has done. Uh, I've received numerous emails and messages on social media talking about my podcast. And, but I have to say, the most important thing for me 
for, for this podcast is that I am making a difference. As you probably know, and I, I have detailed quite a few times, my mental health is, is not always the best. In fact, I, I would probably say it's quite severe at times, and that has led to a lot of inconsistencies in my release schedule, in my contacts, on social media and my updates. And so I'd, I just want to take the opportunity to, to thank you for showing, showing your support for me during these times. Oh God, I'm trying not to get all teary because it's the last episode. Last episode of the season. But we've had a lot of improvements. We've had a lot of really impactful, inspiring stories and people on this podcast. Surprisingly, some of, the, some of my favorite episodes were just with, with people who have had experiences with the world that I could never imagine. You know, despite all the mental health, I, you know, I've been, been handed to me a lot of luxuries and a lot of good things. Jobs, education, I'm in a socio socioeconomic advantage. And throughout this podcast, uh, I've, ha I've had the opportunity to develop my own ideas and develop my own opinions and, and breadth of knowledge and knowledge of experience in particular. And so I also want to take the opportunity to thank my supporters on Patreon, especially Patrick Vetti, who has uh, recently gone through some, some quite harsh consequences of life. Um, he's, he's been a big mover in, in terms of me upgrading my equipment and my software and, and keeping me going with this podcasting journey during my very severe low that I had during, during the end of last year. I also want to thank my family and my girlfriend for, for, for supporting me through this journey. It's been something that, that, I've, that I've taken on independently. I've, I've spent hours and, and days of hours even recording, editing, promoting, <laughs> talking to people. And I can say that, that honestly, you know, it's, it's, although it feels sometimes like a, a sole effort, it, it couldn't be possible without the people who, who are willing to come and, and talk to me about these issues talk to me about their lives. There's so many people who have contributed to this, removing all of all of all of the editing and such. And it's it's really made this podcasting journey for me very special. If you have stuck through all of the episodes or popped in now and again to, to listen to something that, that piqued your interest, thank you so much. I I'd never envisaged myself to be in a, in a place where people would tune in to listen to me talk. We've had ups and downs. We've had good things. We've had bad things. We've had glaring, amazing things like, like having Steve on the podcast and a bunch of really high profile autism advocates. And we've had our lows as well. You know, difficulties with the awards and the quality of, of the podcasts. All I can say is that it's definitely been a the journey and I'm very grateful to to have you along with me to to go on this journey so thank you thank you so much in the first episode of season two which may be coming out a little bit sooner I'm going to be talking to one of you one of you listeners a lovely girl called Liv from Live Label Free does a lot of work with autistic people and a lot of work around eating disorders and we're going to take a good, good old look at the 40 or two podcast. Look at our favorite moments, our, our, you know, the, the, the interesting conversations, the, the funny moments, the entertaining moments. And we're all going to, we're going to reflect on, on what this entity is, this, this podcast is, and um, try and do it in, in a fun way. So look forward to that. I will end this here. I'm not going to do the old stick of uh, go follow me on my podcast and all that, but I do, <laughs> you know, if by chance you, you, you found this podcast helpful and you do want to get in contact, please ne never feel like you can't. Email is usually the best place to do it. If you just want to, to, to share your thoughts or to, if you, if you want to be on the podcast and you want to share experiences, 
I'm always willing to to hear people out, and I'm always willing to to help spread those stories so other people can learn from them. In terms of the second series, you can look forward <laughs> to another one, possibly in a bit bit of time, maybe the end of this year, maybe the start of next year. I'll be doing a lot more work on social media and on different platforms. I'm getting into doing some public speaking and I'm hoping to promote the podcast to make it a bit more accessible to the world. The ignition for doing all of this is to try and make a difference and I feel like giving myself that space to to do other things and to take a bit of time away from that that grueling editing process. It's going to be good for me and it's going to be good for the podcast and I'm never gone. I'm still here and if you want to get in contact, I'm always available. And um, yeah, as always, stay strong, keep learning, keep carrying on, keep trying to make a difference, keep living. We all have our own individual challenges and we all have the difficulty and, and trauma and problems with this life. And it's, it's something that, you know, a, a problem shared is a problem half reach out to people, reach, reach out to me, reach out to other autistic people and learn from them, learn about different opinions. Keep in mind that everybody's experience of life is different and I'm sure many of you struggle with the mental health sides and struggle with many aspects to being autistic and just know that that's okay. And just know that if you follow your strengths and you, you make something out of your strengths, you will progress. Things will get easier over time. Things will get better. We can all make a contribution to society, but we first need to make a contribution to our own lives and set out to improve it. I hope the information that I've given you and the experiences that I've provided, along with, of course, my <laughs> podcast guests, has been useful. And I would encourage all of you to... to reflect on these conversations and these points and these opinions and reflect on your own life in doing so to try and improve things further. We all have improvements to make on our, on our life journey and I'm incredibly grateful that I've been able to be a part of yours. So thank you. Anyway, I'm going to start rambling. <laughs> have a good day and I will See you very soon.